Good morning. How you doing? Great day to be with the church. We're finishing our Ephesians series. And if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and today I am talking about blessed in the battle, blessed in the battle. Always encourage you to take notes. The scripture starts, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let me start with a little confession today, a confession that my, my children might not believe. As a kid, I loved video games. Okay, so... Who, who has ever played a video game? I, I want to see your hands. You've ever played a video game. I think that's almost everyone. So I think you'll, you'll relate. Here, here is why. Now, I, I'm always on my kids to not play video games. I think it's a pretty big waste of time. But here is what I love. I'm like, raise your hand. You're wasting your time. Uh, here is what I, I did love, and, and it was this, that you would be taken into another world, and often you were in a battle. And in this battle, you would be, you'd be running, and you'd be able to pick up these different weapons or these different tools that would enhance your ability to fight. And the reason I bring this up is that is how I saw spiritual warfare for years. So here I am, I'm, I'm running through the battle of life, and then Ephesians 6, we come to, in the Bible, this powerful text that starts unpacking the armor of God and specifically these weapons we fight with. And so it looked something like this. Here I am running and fighting, and all of a sudden, oh, look! It's a sword. Whoom. And, and so I'm, whoa, whoosh, 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 yeah, ah, ah, right like that, right? If you didn't see me over this side, I'm like, ah, 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 right? You're, you're yielding. It's Robert Herbert running, grabs the sword of the spirit, and starts fighting. Now, I, I'm not saying that's not good. I, I, I do think that's, that's a, a powerful truth in the Christian life because it says, be strong. Be strong. And I, so many people I find feel weak when it comes to dealing with the trials, the temptations, the burdens, and the pains of life. And here Paul is saying, be strong. But here is this new paradigm. The, the last two weeks have, have really been a paradigm shift for me. And I don't know if you've ever had one of these experiences in your spiritual life where God reveals a truth, maybe something you've seen for years, but all of a sudden it's just this, this light bulb going off, and then you start seeing it everywhere in the Scripture. The, the Scripture doesn't say, finally be strong in the armor. The Scripture says, finally be strong in the Lord. Be strong Okay, one of the things I've enjoyed, I, I, I like spending time with our youth group. I like coming to this, the epic anchored, the big parties. And so Joel will bring in inflatables and different games. But one of my favorite things to watch is how excited the kids get to be sumo wrestlers. To get, have you ever seen those sumo suits? I actually brought one. Can you go get it for me, guys? And so here is actually how I see it. Uh, the, the, the Bible says, be strong in the Lord. Here, here's the amazing thing about these sumo suits is you get in them. You're actually inside this suit. Whoa, okay. And um, ah, this is amazing. Uh, like, no longer do you see my Robert Herbert's legs. No longer do you see my little under 200-pound frame, but now I am in the sumo suit. I'm in the sumo suit. And the, and the reason we love this so much is it totally changes how we fight. It totally changes your fighting experience if you've ever been to one. Now, what you might not know, Christian, our facilities director, also trains in MMA. Right? So usually I'd probably be afraid for him to punch me. But watch this. Give me a shot. Oh. Nothing. <laughs> you got a kick for me? Didn't really feel it. 
Now, listen, Ephesians 6, though, doesn't say the enemy just punches you or kicks you. It says he starts firing the flaming darts. Is that all you got? Now, this is, I, I think, a, a much better understanding of how we're to be strong. We're in the Lord. So I, I started seeing these scriptures this week. Look, look, look at this. It says this, Galatians 3.27, For all you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Right? Uh, listen to this one. This, this is a very famous one, Gal- uh, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. You know, the old person is dead, and you're now in the Son of God. Watch this. I I just showed you the defensive way of fighting. I didn't feel a thing. That was great for me. Look, look at what uh, Colossians 3.3 3 says. For you died. Here's the real one. <laughs> For you died. <laughs> and your life is now hidden in Christ. Let's give these guys a hand. It's a challenge to be on my staff. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Think about this for a second. How do we fight? You're dealing with temptation. You, the, the, the goal in life is not to be thinking about the temptation and, and just saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come against this temptation. The goal is to focus on being in Christ. Why? Because you know that Jesus can't sin. Jesus doesn't get beat by the enemy. So we're, we're all thinking, oh, I've just got to be stronger. No, your goal is not to just be, I'm going to fight the enemy. No, your goal is, I'm just going to be in Christ. If I'm in, do, do you know that Jesus doesn't fall to temptation? Do you know that when I am focused, when I am lost in Jesus, I don't struggle much with sin? The goal isn't to always find the sin and then, ah, oh, I'm just going to be vigilant. No, the goal is to live in Christ. I, my, my, my whole goal is getting lost in him. I'm fellowshipping with him. I'm loving him. I, I'm worshiping him. I'm being renewed by him. I'm in Christ. That is how we fight our battles. Can someone help me out again? Thank you. Now, now here's, the, uh, here's the thing. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In his mighty power. Uh, so many times in the Christian life, we, just, we feel like we're struggling, but it's all about accessing his power. I, I, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this. I know when God called me to preach, I thought, oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? I'm a singer. I feel very comfortable singing in front of people, but I'm not a communicator. Like growing up, I was not the person who would mesmerize people with my great oratory skills. In fact, I often didn't know what to say. And so we can actually be in meetings and I'll just start stumbling over my words and Steph will just kind of laugh at me and I'm like, I'm just not a natural communicator. But when I step up here and, and I've spent time with the Lord, there's an anointing that comes on me, and all of a sudden my, my thoughts just start flowing together, and God starts anointing my words, and he loses my tongue, and I feel the power of God. <laughs> Be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power. That's my dream for you, is that you would find that place of walking in his mighty power. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, here's the problem is so many of us just feel like we're going about just normal life on earth, and, and it's just, you know, kind of life as usual. I'm going to wake up and might go get a breakfast burrito, might catch some waves, see my friends at school or work. Do you know that as you're waking up, the enemy's going, <laughs> I got 
got some schemes, right? You are in a war. You were born into a battle. When you stepped into your new life in Christ, you have an enemy, and his name is the devil. You're, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. You were born into a family in a feud, and it's the kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. And so the devil has schemes, but that's why he's saying, he's saying put on the armor of God. And, and the armor of God, what God's been speaking to me is the armor of God is being in Christ. It's not just running on your own and trying to pick up a few tools here and there. No, you stand against the enemy's schemes by being in Christ. I'm going to skip verse 12 for a minute. I'm going to go to verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, can I just tell you that the scripture says there are days of evil. There are natural disasters that come and, and try to wipe us out. There are people that come to persecute us. There's sickness. There's disease. There's evil people that, that try to do evil things to us. The Bible says, Jesus actually says, in this world you will have trouble. And that's why we have to walk in the armor of God. But it's not just that. As you look at the Greek meaning of day of evil, right? It says, emera ponera, which means this. It means the toils, the annoyances, the, the perils. You know, sometimes just even the little annoyances that are trying to get us out of the spirit. Those are the things that are trying to steal the joy out of life. And the key is walking in God. Now, put on your spiritual diving mask because we're about to go into the deep waters. That's why I skipped to verse 12 for a minute. Verse 12 says this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in this realm. So let me just explain our battle for a second. It's not just against flesh and blood, although at one time you probably realized, oh, not everyone likes me. You were on the playground, you built a beautiful saint castle, and some bully comes and goes, Poof. and you're like, what? I thought this, you know, I thought, why can't we all get along, right? And so you know we've got enemies, and as you know, as Americans, we think, well, gosh, ISIS is trying to destroy us. Or if 70 years ago, you would have said that the Nazis are our enemies. And so true, we do have earthly enemies. But Paul is saying, but Christian, you've got to understand, there's a spiritual enemies. There's spiritual enemies. That is why so many crazy things happen. And then he explains this. He says, the rulers, the authorities, and the powers from my studies and, and my personal life experience, I believe these are actually declensions of spiritual forces. It says this, there's powers of this dark world, and there's spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. So there's two more divisions. There's, there's powers that are working on earth, but there's also powers in the heavenly realms. So let me explain it this way, the, the three different ones, the rulers. Rulers, if you look at the Greek word, that, that word is arche, right? That word is parallel to archangelos, which is the archangel, the archangel Michael, right? So what we know is there's different strata of angels, right? There's a host of angels, and then there's the archangel. We also know that there's rulers over whole regions. So if you remember in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, Daniel's on a fast. He's praying. We're actually calling a fast this week. That's how we believe we do spiritual warfare is through fasting and praying. But Daniel is on this fast. He's praying. And the archangel Michael comes and says, I was detained by the prince of Persia. There's a ruler over a region. Secondly, you have authorities. Maybe the easiest way to understand this is we have authorities in the city of San Diego. For, for example, a police officer in San Diego. He's an authority. We have to, he, he can control things. But listen, a police officer in San Diego goes to Yuma, and he doesn't have authority anymore. He's an authority over a certain local area. Then there's powers. It says powers of this dark world. That word is cosmo krato, which Cosmo means the world, and then Krato is a, a power. Those are demons. 
So let me explain this for a second. Many people, many Christians are afflicted by demons. What, what might that affliction look like? I, I, I meet people all the time that say, I was in, in the middle of the night, I woke up and there was this heavy pressure pushing down on my chest and I felt this presence. That's demonic oppression. Or I, I, all of a sudden I got choked. Or all of a sudden I was hearing these voices telling me to harm myself. I, I, and, and so I talk about that because many times people think I'm going crazy. You're not going crazy. You're being attacked by demons. And what you see throughout the word is that Jesus would come to people that were demonically attacked. Remember the little child that was throwing himself in the fire? And Jesus comes up and rebukes the demon and it flees. Jesus actually tells us in Scripture, Mark 16, you're going to actually be able to command demons to leave. And so we do this all the time in this church. I could tell you a hundred stories of people that were being afflicted. That's actually one of the things we do in our Freedom Day. If you haven't been to one, I encourage you, write it down, November 10th. That Saturday will be a Freedom Day. We want everyone in our church to go through it because what I find is so many Christians don't live in the freedom that Christ has purchased for us. You don't have to live under demonic oppression. That's, that's the demonic. Those are powers. But now let's go to authorities. Authorities, per- perhaps you've had this kind of experience. You've walked into a building and you've gone, whoa, there is a dark presence here. Right? There's something that feels weird. Or you go into a place and you're like, why is everyone so sensual in this, in this room or in this, this area? Those are authorities that are influencing the atmosphere. Now, just like I, as a, as a person, I, I can cast out demons. I can tell demons to leave me that are afflicting me. This is how you do it. You say, in Jesus' name, leave me. I belong to Jesus. I speak the blood of Jesus over me. I'll tell you, it has to leave. Demons come into people's lives through open doors. So you watch a lot of pornography. You let demons, the enemy has authored that, so you're letting demons track into your life. So often demons of lust come into people's lives. You watch a lot of horror movies. Demons of fear, demons of violence come into your life. That's how demons traffic into our life. They also traffic through fear. They also traffic through generational strongholds. Why is this family, why does everyone deal with alcoholism? Because it's passed down. But guess what? We can cut it off. Because you're a new man because you're in Christ. Authorities, authorities though, over a specific area, how do we deal with that? Ephesians 3, we talked about several weeks ago. It says his intent, this is Jesus' intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So we come together as a church to bind up and dispel authorities. Let me give you a story that might help illustrate this. In uh, in 2000, Steph and I had gone through our school of transformation, and we went on an outreach to Eskishe here, Turkey, a a city of about 500,000 in the nation of Turkey. What we found out was that there hadn't been a church in the city in 500 years, and there were no known Christians, no known believers. So we land in this place, and we have four weeks of outreach, four weeks of preaching the gospel, four weeks of making friends and sharing with them. And after four weeks, no one had accepted Jesus. It was very discouraging. So we said, what are we going to do? We, we, we can't leave here without seeing God move. So we, d- we called a fast. So we said, we're going to fast for these next several days. So we fasted, and then we said, we're going to do an all-night all prayer. Now, we're making it so much easier on all of you because on Thursday night, we're just going to pray for an hour and a half. But our team said, we're going to pray all night. So we went up on a, on a tall mountain over the city of Eskishe here, and we're praying. And one of our main questions is, God, why are we not seeing a breakthrough? Why are we not seeing people come to know Jesus? We're preaching the gospel, but why? And I, I've never had this experience before. I can't say that I've ever had it again, but as I'm asking the question why, I get a proper name. I get the name Zophar. And I'm like, what in the world is that all about? But I write it down. I tell my team. And and back then, you couldn't Google things. Now you can Google that and look, and it's the fifth meaning of it. But I I couldn't do that back then. And so 
the next day we're with a Turk that speaks both English and Turkish, and he was, he was into some dark stuff. His name was Imre, and so I ask Imre, so what does the name Zafar mean? And he stops, and his eyes get all big. And he goes, it means controller or conqueror. He goes, how do you know that? He said, God spoke to us. So we said, God, what do we do? And God led us to do a prayer walk in a specific area, the, the center of Eskishay here, where the government building and the central mosque was. And we did a prayer walk. And then we started worshiping it. And we came together and declared that Jesus is Lord over that city. So, so hear me very carefully. Don't go trying to find out names of authorities. That's not what I'm saying. And we certainly don't go attacking them and cursing them. We're not on some hunt. That's not us. We're, we want what God reveals. And what we do with it is we come together and worship. And we come together and say, God, wherever our feet trod, you're going to give us the land like you did in Joshua. And we're going to come together and lift up the name of Jesus. So you might be going, well, Robert, that sounds a little hokey. Can I just tell you that just a couple hours afterwards, I went to meet with the main guy I had been sharing with for a month. And we're walking, and he doubles over, and I said, what's wrong? He goes, I'm dealing with this abdominal pain that I always deal with. I said, let me pray for you. I lay my hands on his stomach, and instantly the pain leaves. He, sh he shoots up like this, and he goes, you're a magician. And I said, no, I'm not a magician. I said, that's the power of Jesus. That's Jesus that I've been proclaiming. Do you believe? He goes, yes, I believe. I go, are you ready to, to give him your life, to follow Jesus with all your heart? He said, yes. Within two days, we had baptized him. And it wasn't just him. The next day, another person believed. The next day, another person believed. We had six people come to know Jesus. And then Steph got arrested, and we had to flee the city. But, <laughs> but we were, and she got to go with us. Um, and she's still alive. She's here and serving your, your kids. Um, but we sent people back, and that church exists today. The first church in a region in 500 years. Now, now, why do I tell this? I tell this to you for you to understand when we gather together as the church and fast and pray, we have authority. We take authority in our region. We take authority in our area, and it dispels the authorities. Uh, it, so I went powers, authorities, but then it says rulers. So we talked about the principle of Persia. There's rulers over whole lands or whole, whole areas. Um, that's why we get together with the other churches in our town and come together and say, we are the church of San Diego County, right? Because I know some of you are like, oh, that's so sweet. Like they can get along with Journey Church and Oh, they like foothills and the grove and all that's cute. It's not about being cute. It's about being the church of San Diego County coming together and saying, Jesus is Lord here, and you are the only rightful ruler. And that's how we shift atmospheres. So it's a big deal. I want to encourage you, join with us, and let's be a contending and worshiping church that lifts up the name of Jesus and dwells in him. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Where is my, oh, there it is. Okay, so here you go. What I used to think is I'm just running around, and all of a sudden, I see this belt, right? And I pick it up. No, do you know that Jesus is the truth? Jesus says in, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth. Like, Jesus is the truth. So you're, I, I'm all about memorizing Scripture and, and speaking Scripture. I, I do that all the time. But can I just tell you the ultimate truth is Jesus. So when you're being attacked with anxiety, you combat it with Jesus. You're my Prince of Peace. I need more of you, Jesus. You're dealing with financial brokenness. You say, Jesus, you're my provider. You're, you're, you're dealing with physical sickness. You say, Jesus, you're the great physician. You are my healer. That is how we appropriate the belt of truth. It's Jesus. And this is the, the breastplate of righteousness. You know, I so often wondered, so what, do I need to go get a, like a breastplate? Where's that around? No, do you know that Jesus is our righteousness? One of the greatest struggles that Christians have is they think, they, they, they walk in condemnation. They're like, I, I'm such a loser. 
I'm such a sinner. I, I, I'm no good. I don't deserve anything. You know what? You're right. You're right. But you're not alive anymore. The Bible says, I've been crucified with Christ. So when you think that, you're thinking about the old you. But the new you is hidden in Christ. And you know that Jesus is your righteousness. When he died on the cross and he rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death and cleansing your sins, when God looks at you, he doesn't see scrawny little Robert. He sees big old sumo Jesus. And so when you're giving yourself to condemnation, it's because you're not seeing yourself in Christ. you got to see yourself in Christ. And so then you can agree with Romans 8, there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you're in Christ Jesus, you don't have to deal with condemnation. When you're dealing with a lot of condemnation, what you can just know is, I'm not walking in who I really am. It says, feet shod with the gospel of peace. Feet that have the gospel of peace. Let me just be honest with you. When, um, well, it's really hard to deal with temptation if you're always going and telling people about Jesus. All right, what, what, what one of my coaches told me in sports was the best defense is a great offense. The best defense is a great offense because then the other team never gets the ball. I remember when Hallie was born, my oldest, it was, I was thinking it's going to be the most joyous occasion. I'm going to be so happy. And, and she was born. I'm so excited. And then the next day, I just got overwhelmed with fear. And up to that point, I hadn't been a fearful person. But I didn't want Steph to leave me alone with her because I was so afraid something was going to happen to her. Like, I didn't even want to hold her because I'm like, my hands are so big and she's so small and I'm going to crush her. I was freaked. I mean, and it sounds funny, but I was freaked out. I couldn't enjoy my daughter because I was so afraid something was going to happen to her. And, you know, I tried to speak truth. I tried to meditate on scripture, and nothing seemed to work. And I got so discouraged, and, and then I got so mad at the devil. And I finally one day had this thought, like, devil, if you're going to ruin my life, then I'm going to ruin yours. <laughs> and I know what ruins your life is I'm going to talk to everyone I see about Jesus. And so I became kamikaze samurai gospel sharer. And I would just, I was like, you know what? I don't like my life anyway. What does it matter what people say? So I would just walk up to everyone. Have you heard about Jesus? Do you know that Jesus loves you? I'd be pumping my gas. Hey, pumping gas? Do you have Jesus, to, you know, in your tank? And, I mean, anything. A, a waiter would come up. Do you need anything? Yeah, I'm more of Jesus. Do you have Jesus? You know, I mean, I was just sharing Jesus. I would stop people on the sidewalk. Do you know what happened? In three days, it lifted. Like, in three days, I stopped being attacked. Do you know why? Because the enemy hates it when we're sharing Jesus. So he realized, man, Robert's now ruining my life. I'm going to stop ruining his. I'm going to go pick on someone else or find another way to pick on him. It just lifted. Can I just tell you, some of you guys need to go kamikaze Jesus share. You're being attacked so much, I dare you. If you're being attacked and you can't get out of it, just try sharing Jesus with everyone and see if the enemy doesn't start removing that. Because he all of a sudden realizes, oh, man, my attack is turning against me. says this, take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. You know, I think, well, what is the helmet of salvation? Can I just tell you? The Bible says this. You have the mind of Christ. You'll never forget this. Well, what's the helmet of salvation? Do you know that when you are in Christ, you actually have a new mind. You have a new, my, your, your mind has a new nature about it. And so you start getting attacked. Don't focus on the attack. I just don't want to keep thinking about lust. No, focus on Jesus. Oh, I just, I'm so greedy. I'm so jealous. Oh, I'm just going to stop, stop jealousy. No, start meditating on Jesus. You have his mind. Wow, I can hear better. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, I, I, 
I love in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, you see Jesus, the hair of white, the robe reaching down his feet, the golden sash, but then it says he has a sword coming out of his mouth. Like Jesus is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus is the sword of the Spirit. Can I just tell you, it's about being in Christ. It's about being in Christ. Walk in Jesus. That is the armor. And it says this, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You know, the way we stay in Christ is through prayer. We say prayer is just simply talking to God. That's one of the ways we, we walk in Christ is we just stay in constant communion, communion with him. Can I, can I just tell you this? It says the prayers in the Spirit. A, a lot of you feel like failures in prayer because you've written out all these prayer lists and then you just can't get through them and it's dry and it's boring. Can I just tell you, I actually don't do that. I come into my prayer time and I say, God, I want to pray what's on your heart today. And so I let him bring things to mind, and then I just partner with him. And then once I feel the burden leave, then I just say, okay, what's next? And I pray through that. Can I just tell you, I don't, I'm not good at praying a prayer list every day. But I really, but I can pray for hours because I pray with the Spirit. It's letting Jesus, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me, so I let Jesus pray through me. And it's wonderful, and it's exciting. Some of you don't like prayer because you've been trying to do it in your own strength. Let Jesus pray through you. And I believe praying in the Spirit is also praying in a prayer language, praying in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says this, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Or Romans 8, 26 says this, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Well, I don't get tongues because that doesn't make sense. Well, it's not supposed to. It's wordless groans. And so you're letting him pray through you. And the Bible says as you do that, your inner man is encouraged. Now, once again, if I don't speak in tongues, am I saved? Of course you're saved. And do you have to speak in tongues to be a part of this church? No, this is all people's church, not tongues church, right? No, uh, But but it's a, it's a gift that you can use to let you. I, how else can you pray continually? Because I have to think about other things, but I can just constantly be praying in the Spirit, praying with that heavenly language. Verse 18, with this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the Lord's people. Paul's finishing this book, and he's saying this. we got to be praying for the Lord's people. Can I just tell you, a victorious church is a praying church. A victorious church is a praying church. You know, our, our staff is not a lot of things, right? There, there's a lot of things that we're, we're, we're not. We're probably not the coolest staff besides Joel. We're not the... We're, we're, we're not the this and that, but can I just tell you one thing we are is we're a praying staff. We, we, we went off and had our staff retreat to, to, to line up the whole fall, but the thing we spent the majority of time in was worship and prayer. Because that's what we believe. Unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers labor in vain. You know, one of the most encouraging things that people say is, I walked through your doors or I walked on your property and I felt the presence of God. Do you know why that is? Because that's what we want to do. We're always praying, God, come and inhabit this place. Come and be with us, God. Prayer is talking to God, and we're just always asking him to come. But listen, I don't want to just be a praying staff. I want us to be a praying church. I want us to come together and be a church that moves mountains through prayer. Please join us. It is a sacrifice, but join us on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in fasting and setting aside that time for prayer. We have sheets on the back that explain it if you've never done it before. Talk to a leader if you've never fasted before. But can I just tell you, I'm inviting you into an exciting, exhilarating ride of your life as you enter into being a person of prayer and fasting. And as we do that, we see the miraculous release. And this is what Paul decides to end this whole book with. Why is it worth fighting the battles? Why is it worth staying in Christ? Why is it worth being a praying people? 
He says this in verse 23, peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. When you're in Christ, your circumstances might be out of control, but we can walk in peace because he is our peace. You might not have ever felt loved by anyone in your life. You might have felt rejected by family. You might have felt despised by your classmates. But the Bible says love from the Father. And we get that when we're in Christ. Not by your own works and your own striving. And then lastly, it says, and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. You might have felt like my life's been so hard. It's just been a fight. It's just been a struggle. But Jesus says my burden is easy and my yoke is easy is light. I was saying to, to the guys this morning as we, we came together and, and pray, our staff was gathered together and praying, and I said, we probably never had a bigger fall in front of us. We're about to launch a fourth service. We're uh, contending to, to get permission to build a new building on the 8 free We're going to raise millions of dollars. We're going into a new life group launch. I mean, there's all these things going on. We're, we're launching our college services. We're doing all this thing. And, but I said, I've never felt so peaceful, and I've never felt our staff so at rest in the history of this church. But it's coming from being in Christ. Can I just tell you that he wants you to be in him so you can experience the peace, the love, and the grace. Let's stand up. Do you believe it this morning? This is God's promise for us. So join us this week. We're calling this Fast of Jesus Fast because we want more hunger for Jesus. It's the greatest gift we could have coming out of three days is I'm hungry for Jesus. We're calling it a Jesus fast because we want more of his presence in our lives. I want people to experience me, my family, to say, wow, I just felt the presence of God. And lastly, we're praying for his power to bring breakthrough in our places of need. Would you close your eyes? Oh, Lord Jesus, it's amazing. This isn't a religion. This is about an opportunity for people to be in you. Lord, it's not about us being good enough. It's that you died on the cross to forgive our sins. And you rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death. And now you come in us and you make us new. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, I want to encourage you to just pray with me right now. You just say, you know, I've been, I've been just trying to get to God. Or I don't know if he's in my life. He actually wants to come in your heart, but it's not through your actions. It's by receiving his free gift. If you want to receive that today, he died on the cross to forgive you your sins. You can't get yourself forgiven, but you can receive his forgiveness. Just pray this after me to say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead. Come and enter my life. And I'll follow you forever. Just everyone praying right now. If you're praying that, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that you experience his love and that you'd know that you're sealed by him. If that's you this morning, you're saying, yeah, I'm giving my life to Jesus, Pastor, or I'm coming back to Jesus, just wave at me real quick. I'm not going to point you out. Just wave at me. Just look up. I wave. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Just wave at me real quick. Thank you. Who else? Just wave at me. Let me see you real quick. Just wave at me. Look at me. Thank you. I see you too. Anyone else? Awesome. Lord, I pray that our friends would know that their, na your, their name is now written in your book of life, that they can never be stolen away from you, that they will join us in heaven when they die. Thank you for their new life. Prayer